Georgia. Wide sugar fine white sand beaches and vast expanses of vibrant green salt marsh define her gorgeous 100 mile coastline. They are her natural beauty. They make you say, ah. Georgia's charm, however, is her picturesque shrimp boats at rustic docks, nets elegantly draping from upright booms. Quaint fishing communities with small-scale seafood processing houses tuck into pockets of land bounded by marsh and saltwater creeks. These picturesque scenes draw you into a rich cultural history. They invite you in to eat the bounty of their nets. They make you stay to have conversations with their people. When I was a kid, I mean, my, my affinity for seafood came from St. Simon's Pier. And so as a kid, my mom um, used to clean houses on St. Simon's, and so I would go down to the pier and crab and fish. On Georgia's beautiful coast, food, seafood in particular, and homegrown vegetables always draw a gathering of friends with hearty appetites. In April 2016, master chef farmer Matthew Rayford, with the assistance of chef Matt Rohr, prepared an elaborate multi-course feast for guests at Hampton Island Lodge. The feast consisted of locally sourced vegetables and seafood caught and harvested that day. First up here, one of our very rare, from a time constraint, delicacies is our local blue crab soft shell. And that's presented here, has just a light grits and buttermilk crust, very tasty. Georgia's coast is abundant and has sustained her commercial fishing families for multiple generations. They share a love of the ocean, islands, and marsh. They make their livings from it and relish the seafood that abounds here. Their stories recount their past, revealing changes in their idyllic ways of life. However, their courses are changing. Their baselines are shifting. Listen closely. They have a lot to tell you. Daddy, um, to me, Daddy was like our, our Superman. It was very productive because you know what you'd be doing from for one season to the next. Daddy was a jack of all trades. He'll have his, his drag net and he'll drag for a little bit of shrimp, catch shrimp, and then when the cold weather come, the winter time come, he was out there with those oysters. And he was very good, had very big hands. Dad's go at nighttime, like, Daddy, where we going? We can't see. And he would go out in them, in them banks and pick oysters. And we'd be like, I can't see these oysters. <laughs> but he would go out there and pick 10 bushels of oysters at nighttime with a little, little headlight and pick those oysters. Me and Buck would be like, Daddy, child, we can't do this. Eh? <laughs> we was able to go now at nighttime ourselves and pick our oysters. The crab season, he would start um, casting for shrimps. Um, Daddy would get up on the tide. Sometimes the tide would suit at 12, sometimes at 1, sometimes at 2. He would go after those shrimps. He would come back um, early in the morning, 5, 6, 7 o'clock, and he would have three and four basket of shrimps that he caught with a shrimp net. And if you know anything about a shrimp net, you know that's a lot of work. And uh, we thank our, thank our father and his father, and, and, and no doubt my grandfather's uh, father who raised him, uh, they all pass it down to us. My husband, we got married in February the 9th. 1946, and um, he bring me over here. We built uh, our first home. And of course, uh, they maintained that same livelihood of fishing in the waters right down here in Harris Nave. 
we are able to make a good living. It's an honest living and certainly one that we are very proud of. My father worked for Al Capone in the 30s and he had a big boat. And then he, he loved, he started fishing. He started out fishing in Wausau Sound, then he started moving offshore. And the reason he had a big boat is he could spend the night on the big boat. Well, he started taking friends of friends of friends. And the next thing he knew, he was in the charter business. And that's how we ended up in the charter business, with people actually wanting to go bring their friends in. Well, we'll pay, you know, we'll pay to go. And then that's how we ended up. My mother got killed in an automobile wreck when I was five. And back then, there wasn't any places you could drop your children off. So daddy took me fishing. I'm talking about a one level 40 foot boat. I had more places on there to play. It was my whole playground. He loved fishing. And he, he pretty much had the same values I did about it. It's just the greatest thing in the world to be able to go catch a fish. We'd catch fish, sometimes we never even knew what they were. The first time I saw a wahoo, I was like, this is the wildest looking king mackerel I have ever seen in my whole life. It, Daddy says, well, I guess it is. I mean, you know. You pull a hook right behind the back of the boat, you're going to catch a fish. It don't matter what it is, you pull them, but you're going to catch something. And see, people think that I, sh I had a strange childhood. Well, if you think about it, my father loved eels, and he would catch them. And while he was cleaning them, he would turn them inside outwards, and then he would tie them around his knees. Now, as a child, this was a normal thing. But if another child came up, they would actually think that my daddy had lost his mind. But my father lived to be 92 years old. He danced like Fred Astaire. His knees never bothered him. And he told me that Mr. Matthews told him that. Frank C. Matthews, Jr. The C in my middle name is my real name. It's Cantarella, C-A-N-N-A-R-E-L-L-A. -N -N -E -L -L -A. It's Italian. I was born here in Savannah, Georgia. 6 August 1929. I've lived here in Savannah all my life. To talk about my family, I guess we have to go back to my grandfather. His name was Matteo Canarella. He was born in Saragusa, Sicily, on the Ionian Sea. He uh, worked as a seaman on boats uh, in Sicily all his life until he acquired his own vessel. He had a two-mast sloop rig, and he would sail from Syracuse on the eastern side of Sicily down to Malta. He would carry produce from the farmers, olives, onions, or whatever, and put it on the British ships down in Malta and send it to Liverpool and bring the money back to the farmer. So in effect, he was a truck farmer, but he had a boat instead of a truck. <laughs> I remember my father was a cabin boy on his boat, and, and uh, he told me that people in marketing never change, that uh, when he would come up to Malta to the buyer of the produce, and the cap man would say, what you got, Cap? He says, oh, I got onions. He says, oh, if you had olives, you'd made a million dollars. And one day he came up there and said, what you got, Cap? He says, I got olives. He says, oh, if you had onions. I got onions, you son of a gun. That's the psychology of marketing. That marketing has been inbred into my family all through the, my life. As a matter of fact, when I, 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 I finished grade school with the Maris Brothers in Savannah, and went to Benedictine and graduated in class of 47 at Benedictine. Then I went to the University of Georgia and got a marketing degree in BBA in 51. After my formal education, I went in business with my father. And the first thing dad did was uh, buy a shrimp boat and a shrimp dock and, and give me the boat to run for three years. Well, after three years of running that boat, I learned a lot about the shrimping business. And I found out that uh, it was not a business you could be home with your wife every night. The shrimp was not very money-wise, uh, worth very much money back in the 30s. It was um, a depression era, and the uh, price of uh, shrimp was uh, $3 a bushel at the most, if you got that much for them. Uh, they were similar to tomatoes. Nobody ate tomatoes in the 1800s, and all of a sudden in the 1900s, they thought, okay, uh, nobody ate very much shrimp back in those days. I decided on shrimping because um, I could do 60000 a year in six months, and I couldn't make that at any other job. My grandfather, they had a place like this rock hill right here and decided he could make it into boom seafood. 
they, before that, they had built some boats way, way up the country and floated them through the swamp. My father was a heck of a teacher. My brother was 11 and I was 12, and, and we were the only crew with my Uncle Mac and inside the dock ever since we could stand on a box and head shrimp, you know, so we, at 12 years old, we, we got a grown man's pay. We were just about the only white boys that was allowed at the table. Grandma, she had a heading crew of probably about 60 people. We got to head because it was our grandparents' dock. You know, I can't even remember. It might have been seven minutes that it took to put 17 pounds in the bucket, but it, they, they always were bragging about me and Greg how fast we could head at the table. That was the main thing with the shrimp boat. If you couldn't head on the back deck, you didn't have no job. Me and Gregory, we went everywhere. We were all over the place. We'd look at it on low tide, and there, if there was a little bit of water on high tide, we'd be dragging on it. He would make me go shrimping in the summertime, and I didn't really want to go, and I got seasick. And, and if I was seasick, I could lay down, and that wasn't a problem. The problem is, I had to go back the next day, and if I got seasick and I laid down, I'd just end up laying in the bunk all day. The kids all the way through, their biggest time of learning shrimping and working on the boat was in Mississippi and Louisiana. And any time they'd start goofing off and didn't work, it cut their pay. So after, a, I don't know, a week or so of that, I decided I, I just got to get over the seasick because he's not going to make me go fishing. So I might as well work and get paid while I'm out here. And that's how I got over seasick. The bank of lawyer purchased uh, Wayne Milling Company from me. I got $80,000. So I came down here, and in the meantime, I'd gotten a divorce, and the kids was, was staying with me. And they learned to ride the shrimp boats with me as I got built my first shrimp boat. And sometime along in there, somebody clued him in that the reason they only worked half a day was because they knew they weren't going to catch anything the rest of the day. So they just went and made those first two good drags in the morning, or three drags, and then went home. I did so many good things and so many bad things. And he worked really, really hard. I mean, back in those days, you got up at 4.30 in the morning, and you left the dock 5.30, and when it started cracking daylight, you were putting your nets out offshore, or in the sound if it was open, and you worked till dark and got home at dark, and then you did it again the next day. He got a lot of experience through all parts of it, and I got where I like to take the weekend off. I'd let Charlie run the boat over the weekend when he wasn't but 15 years old. Uh, everybody thought I was awful foolish to trust a kid with an expensive trunk boat. But not only did it, it was it all right, it paid off well and did a hell of a good job in educating him how to really make a good fisherman. Last year we bought, I think about 12 million nursery seed. We probably got well over half of the aquaculture production in Georgia. And it's not that I'm any smarter than anybody else, I'm just hungrier. I owe the bank more money than they do. So these are Charlie Phillips clams? Charlie Phillips clams, yes. That's right. Yeah. Oh my God, these clams are delightful. Well, those clams are all about money right there. So Charlie Phillips, <laughs> one, one of the things that Charlie had told me, he was like, you know what, my clams don't need nothing. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, 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 there you go. And he raised his family out of this river, just like I raised my family out of the river. Started catfishing stuff, and he was a, City policeman one time, he was city councilman one time, but he started out fishing. And then he started gator hunting, catching, uh, killing gators, you know. When they couldn't hardly catch shrimp, he'd get gators and stuff. And, or not catch them, but kill them. And they'd get like five dollars a foot. He'd go get three or four gators a night and make 60, 70, 80 dollars. Well, back in the early 60s, 60, 80 dollars a day. 
you know, people weren't making out a week with the, with the cost of uh, living and everything. So Daddy would make good money both ways. People like him are gone. I lost him about six years ago. But the history of this community that went with him, you know, just all that history's gone. My grandfather had a bear try to come in the boat with him, that same old boat swimming the river. And he started coming over the boat with him and the bear touched his nose to the muffler on that single engine engine. And it burned his nose and he fell back overboard. That's the only thing. And my grandfather was beating him with a paddle and everything, trying to get him. My father was walking with two five gallon buckets of catfish heads and guts. He was walking down there and a plane went flying by. He was walking with the bucket and walked right overboard, watching the plane. Because <laughs> he ain't never seen a plane, you know, that's the first time he's seen a plane. He just walked right on overboard and both buckets in there. It's like my father taught me how to fish and where to fish at and all that. I've done my son the same way over the years. They, they like me. As soon as they could get on the boat, I had them on the boat working with me every summer. I didn't never have to worry about them getting in trouble in the summer because they stayed on the boat with me, both of them, the whole summer. And they made money, you know, and I gave them, I gave them good money for helping me out on the boat and everything. And then they'd go out on the weekends and help me too. Looked like I'd done with my father, and I never did get in any trouble. Been on the boat since I was about six, seven years old. Off and on, I've, I've been on uh, all after school and stuff. I would, I run trout lines. When my granddaddy gave me my out, my first outboard when I was 12 years old. Before school and after school, I'd run trout lines in the river there, and we'd clean them after school there, and I'd sell them and make extra money. Georgia's multi generational fishing families have many characteristics in common. It is their resourcefulness and resilience that stand out. When oysters are out of season, they set out catfish traps. In spring, when the sounds open up, they drag nets for shrimp. As generations age, the industry is significantly shifting. As supplies diminish, different ways must meet demands. If once, it, once this gets in your blood, it's hard to get away from it. You can always come back to this water and make a living, and make a good living. Clean living. I just. I started supporting the family in 72. I'm talking about really fishing the whole full time. We used to catch more with a boat pulling two of them 40 foot net than what we do now with the ramp. My boat, my big boat, pulling four big net. To make ends meet, they got more nets. Instead of dragging one, they got two. And later on, they put found four. Big boats put down as much as five nets. But I liked working on cold water shrimp, especially once I got the Blackbeard because it was a bigger boat and had more power and more electronics and was a lot more comfortable and you could clock. You got enough crew and when you found the shrimp, you just stayed on them and moved when they moved. And we'd go out and catch 100, 150 baskets of shrimp and three or four, five clocks. Just dragged till we couldn't go anymore. You know, we would catch so many fish, it's ridiculous. If you had a 180 quart cooler now or a 160 quart cooler, that was a full cooler. You know, we catch those fish, sometimes they'd be 50 pounds, 50 pounds. But as far as catching that many fish, I don't know if it's more about them not being as available or that we know now, we're more educated about the fact that uh, I know from past stupid things that I've done, like when I found the wreck offshore, I mean, I caught 7,000 pounds of fish off of over a couple of years, but why did I just, you know, I should have just, that was four again before limits. So why didn't I just catch a few and go on? So somebody said, well, hey, let's try to catch a sturgeon. And they caught the devil out of them in the first two or three years. We caught, I'm talking about just caught them. I'm talking about I caught 42 by myself. And my brother, he caught 30 something, and that saved me something sturgeon in that one season. And everybody started fishing, and everybody kept getting into it because you can make so much money quick. More and more people got to get in, and the sturgeon got less and less and less because it got divided up. And then after a while, it takes 12 years for them to spawn to get big enough to spawn. They don't grow by like 10 pounds a year. And we've catch so many of them, so many people fish for them to catch them, you just kind of send them out. Then got where you couldn't hardly catch none at all, so then the federal government stepped in and closed down. When I was in fish class, is what it was called, it was a monstrosity. It was like, <clears throat> broke 
Jesus, like, I mean, you got a huge fish to break down. And it was like, yeah. where did they out. get this? Like, mm-hmm. Where did where they get this? Is there a halibut that actually grows that big? Like, how did they get to that <laughs> massive yeah. size, right? Now I can, get a, I can get a piece of halibut. I can get a filet of halibut. It would be not much bigger than this plate. It's a big flounder. It's like a big, it's like a big flounder for me now. While commercial fishing families experience changes firsthand, researchers track trends scientifically over decades. Natural resource management agencies like NOAA, Georgia Department of Natural Resources, and South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council set regulations based on scientific data to ease stress on seafood populations. So, who should we believe? The commercial fishers see what's going on daily. Researchers, on the other hand, look at long-term trends. So are strict regulations that necessary? No one really agrees. They weren't catching any more shrimp because the shrimp supply had diminished. And we realized that the shrimp cycle uh, is needs to be cared for. It's a renewable natural resource that need to be taken care of. And the greed of man is to take all he can get while he can get it and don't worry about tomorrow. One of the things you learn about early on is called the tragedy of the commons. And the concept goes back to grazing lands in old England and they had common grazing areas and all the farmers would let their cows graze there. No one really owned it, it was the commons. It belonged to everyone commonly. So what happened in those areas was the ground was quickly overgrazed because it's in every individual's best interest to let his cows eat as much of that ground, as much of that grass that he doesn't own as he can. And then he can get more milk and have more cows. And that's a fundamental concept of fisheries management is the tragedy of the commons. As apparent as it could be in grazing land in a village, imagine how it is in the ocean where none of us can look in the ocean and see what's going on down there. Divers can see a very, very small area, but you can't fly over the ocean and see the fish like you could fly over the U.S. and see the forest or see the agriculture fields or what have you. We as humans can't really grasp it because the environment's foreign to us. So it's that much easier than in the ocean for the tragedy of the commons to take place. And it's in everyone's best interest to go out and catch as many fish as they can. If you're a commercial fisherman and that's how you make your living and you sell fish, you want to catch as many fish as you can as quickly as you can and sell them for as much as you can. So, you know, the individuals that are just acting as we expect when they go out on their own and take too many fish. So you need something that solves that. And the idea of the tragedy comes, the only way you solve that is by regulations that affect everyone so that we, we protect this fish so that individuals acting sanely don't go and, and over harvest what is there. And there's plenty of records. The historical record is full of examples of fisheries that have been wiped out. They banned the nets in 95. Fishmen, they put the fishmen out of business. Uh, I've made a suggestion that they would rescind that law and that the Florida beaches, both east and west, be fished by fishermen that can produce good quality seafood to the people. And uh, of course, it's not going to happen. I know it's not. Nobody's that interested in what the people want, really. I don't care what form of government you are or where you're at in government, that's not going to happen. But all this uh, resources there available, it's not going to be taken advantage of. The scientists said you're that in the southeast for maybe 30, 40 years have been catching too many red snapper and it's done uh, some pretty unfortunate things to the size and the health of the population. We've never gone out there and said, well, guys, you know, where'd all the fish gone? It's always been just as good as what it was 40 years ago for us. All the years that I fished up till about seven years ago, we never, ever caught the first red snapper, not the first one. One day out at Gray's Reef there, we were fishing and we caught, we got into a little group of red snapper and we caught seven, me and another guy. 
we saw red snapper catches get more and more frequent with us. We, we'd catch more and more. Every trip, we'd pick up one or two, not just at Gray's Reef, but all around. If your baseline were from the time it was at its lowest or even, you know, five years after that to where it is now, well, yeah, you're seeing the best fish you've ever seen. But the stock assessment had a much longer picture going back into the 70s, and we knew that the population had been much more abundant in the 80s. The goal of the assessment is to give us a whole stock, the picture on an entire stock of fish. And in the case of black sea bass, that's a stock that extends from central Florida up to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. That's a big area. Landings have been, you know, virtually unheard of in North Carolina for many, many years, while in north central Florida, where this population was centered, they were still seeing good fish. So, you know, there's recruitment going on and fish are being born, but they're not really spreading that far. So if I'm in the core area of a fish, I may not perceive the problem that someone on the fringes see. That's why our stocks cover the full range, and that's why when scientists do sampling, they cover not only where the fish are, but where the fish could be. Now, these populations can cover a very large area, and any one fisherman can't see all that area. It's, it's just humanly impossible for any single fisherman to see all that. So a lot of times when we go up and down the coast and hear from fishermen and, and we're dealing with stock assessment issues, we may hear fishermen in one area saying, the fishing is great, it's good as it's ever been, your science is completely wrong, while fishermen in another area may say, these fish are gone. It's just the nature of a fish and any biological creature that as individuals get removed, as we exploit them, as we harvest them, if we harvest too many and there's fewer out there, then they condense down and their range gets smaller and they condense down to like a core area where it's the prime area where that species originates from. And it may take a long time before that area shows a decline in the number of fish. And you know, they think a mullet lives forever, a shrimp lives forever, oyster lives forever. That's baloney. Everything's got a life cycle to it. Everything. Human beings on down, elephant, whatever. Mountains got a life cycle to it. It's not like uh, we're going to replenish and you're going to walk on shrimp or you're going to walk on pompano or mackerel. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, but that's the mentality of some of the people that pass those rules and regulations. An increase in the number of people fishing, combined with advancements in fish finding technology, caused a dramatic decline in various target fish populations. Added to that was increasing pressures from watchdog NGOs, non-government organizations, to manage the fish populations back to healthy levels. All of these factors resulted in the federal government enacting drastic management measures in 2007, then-President George W. Bush reauthorized the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, making it mandatory to end overfishing in one year. This was accomplished by setting catch limits and putting into place accountability measures. Ocean Conservancy's position on the fishery management plan that prohibits bottom fishing in a large portion of the southeastern United States I don't necessarily think it's a, it's a ban, I mean, I suppose it is, but it's a part of a fishery management plan that's designed to end over fishing and restore this really important species. The species is really important to the ecosystem and also to the coastal economies in the southeast U.S. There was like 2,000 licenses way back. Now there's only a couple of hundred. Ever since they've closed the sound, it's been gradually downhill, the shrimp and anything, as far as catches and all. More boats but less shrimp, and now you got less boats and less of shrimp. We have seen a shift in those. We have seen about a 60% decline in fishing effort, meaning the number of shrimp trips since 1989. About 28% reduction in the vessels. Our number of vessels decreases every year, primarily because the vessels are getting old. Most of the vessels are in the range of 40 to 50 years old, and most of them are wooden. So they have a lifespan. And so as the vessel's retired, we're not seeing new vessels come into the fleet. I'm having a tough time. And if, if I'm having a tough time after this many years of experience, everybody's having a tough time. I, I really think it's, um, 
it's really coming fast to an end. I do. My children aren't doing it. My brother has one. One of my crew members, 73, 163, and several people told me that when the 73 quits that, that I've got to quit. <laughs> Being a commercial fisherman is, is a very tough job. I kind of relate them back to the American farmer. They're very independent. That's probably part of their downfall too. That independence also hurts them in some regards. I think that's one of the fascinating things about commercial fishing is that a lot of times it is multi-generational and it's something that, you know, they're hard workers because of changes with, with imports. I mean, we import over 90% of the seafood we eat these days. Um, it becomes a numbers game. You know, the quantity of seafood we produce here, can that meet the demands for what we even have in Georgia? The tuna, that albacore, is just incredible. What's, what's the difference? The color. Truly. I mean, yes, of course, I mean, it's a little leaner, it doesn't have as much fat, so it has a little bit of that swordfish texture to a degree. But if you cook it right, and you have that right preparation, and you have that beautiful color, it really can turn into uh, something pretty special. For me, it really just boils down to the fact that, as a chef, you want to put your hands on the best ingredients possible at all times, 100%. So when I was first, you know, getting started down here in Savannah, you knew it was all around you. You had this incredible seafood, but you couldn't touch it. All you had were the big suppliers that provided this at the back door. But at the end of the day, you didn't know where that rest of that seafood was going. And, you know, for me, you can't, you can't live without it. What do you mean where it was going? Well, if it's there and it's being caught, then who's consuming it and where, where's the market? Because at that point, the local chefs, the retail markets, were, were not selling it. You know, it was all coming in from um, Asian farm and, and all that, you know. And for us, I mean... We need to be touching fresh seafood. All the time, all the time. The oyster that we have down here, they have the best taste than any oyster anywhere in the world. You can't make a shrimp coming out of a freshwater pond taste like wild Georgia shrimp. It's terrible what some people call good. What we have here is amazing. Every chef that I run across, when I tell them I'm from the coast of Georgia, and they're like, oh, what y'all got down there? <laughs> everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> and when I say everything, I'm saying everything. We have some of the best seafood in the world. I believe that our seafood can go up against any, anybody else's seafood. The quality of our products, we're fortunate. We have a superior product and being able to try and get that to the consumers who are willing to pay for it more is an important step, but trying to compete with, with imports that are often sold at a lot lower prices, losing that infrastructure, the amount of fuel you used to get, or, or even things like buying a boat. Our boats continue to age, and what it used to cost to repair a boat versus what today is, it's, it's almost cost prohibitive. You got to catch a hell of a volume of shrimp for the price of the fuel to make the difference in the price of the fuel. Then they, all they do is just import more shrimp. This here is a dying industry. How much longer it's going to last, you or I don't know. It's, it's kind of sad that you go out and you work four days. Now, four days and you have worked really hard and you've used a lot of fuel. You're away from the family. And the first four days goes to fuel. It goes to ice and crew and not much repair now and then the fifth day you, you see a profit. Who, who do you know that goes and works four days free and the fifth day you start making a profit? But that's the way it happens a lot of times when we go out in the ocean. Just the external cost of trying to remain in the fishery has, has really put a lot of burden. You know, these guys still are fishing, but they have a lot more uh, external factors to deal with that makes it harder and harder to make a living. And, 
And unfortunately, we've, we've heard from a number of fishermen who are multi-generational saying, I don't want my children doing this because it has become too difficult. You know, that's really sad to hear that because that's, that's an integral part of our coast, both its culture, its heritage, but even from an economic aspect, that's something that's very unique about our coast. People come from Atlanta or all over our country come here and they wanna see the shrimp boats. They wanna see the docks. I think that's something that really makes Georgia stand out and, and part of the scenic beauty. You know, you have to ask in five, 10 years, if, if those children aren't gonna continue it, who is? There ain't as many shrimpers out there. See, when I was a little kid, there was, there was 12 boats at this dock, 20 boats at that dock, 20 boats at that dock, 10 boats at that dock. And now there ain't 37 boats in this whole waterfront. And that's the most shrimp boats that I have counted on any one spot, you know, in, in the state of Georgia. This is like the last stand right here. And there's gonna be very few shrimpers around. You, can't, you just can't compete with the import stuff. The price of everything's going up. The price of shrimp has gone down, and the price of all your webbing and, and your fishing gear, everything's double, triple. Imports were taking their toll on prices. Um, and fuel was going up, insurance was going up, all the maintenance costs were going up. It's hard to get help, um, good help. So all your costs were going up, but your product wasn't going up. They want to come down to the dock and buy shrimp off that shrimp boat. And I tell you, when you, when you buy shrimp right here and you go home and you cook it, you know why this needs to keep going. We're doing the same thing they were doing, you know, 30 years ago. Very little change, and on top of that, there's not any new boats and the crews are getting older. So you take an older boat and an older crew, even if you've got a, a newer fathom meter, you're not gonna be able to work the hours. You're not gonna be able to, you know, I try to work smarter now that I'm getting a little older, but you know, just as far as getting out and grinding, the catchability is not going up. We've seen a, about a 32% reduction in landings, but that's a combination of 32% reduction in landings and a 62% reduction in effort. So both of them are going down, but the number of trips is going down at a faster rate. Those are one things we're seeing, and then environmental factors could be affecting it as well. We've had an issue in the shrimp industry called black gill. It's a ciliate that affects the gills. They turn black. The gills are dying is what happens. They had like dark gills and it would, they would shed to try to get rid of that parasite. Well, it didn't get rid of it, so they would shed again. It actually makes our shrimp shed about three times trying to get rid of that parasite, which gives three times more of a chance of a fish eating their eyeballs or their legs. They're too weak. They're too weak to firm back up quick. So we're losing right now, we're losing three crops. And we first observed it in our shrimp trawl surveys back in 96, and no one really knew what it was. And uh, we've continued to see it almost every year except for three years since. And it's, the prevalence seems to be getting a little bit higher. We should be walking on shrimp. It doesn't hurt the meat any, but it's causing the shrimp to shed and and it kills them. Several years ago, I guess in 2012, the Marine Extension Service, they asked Sea Grant if they would fund a project on Black Gill. They funded it, we were, we were involved in it, we're partners on that grant. And as a result, we've started working with parasitologists at Skidaway Institute who know how to identify these organisms and try to isolate them and look at their life history and start to figure out what's going on. We know it's a cilia, but we actually don't know what that cilia is. We think it's undescribed. It's everywhere. But this is very true of all microbes. There's so many of them, and the diversity is so high, that we know just a teeny fraction of what's out there. And it turns out, I think, that this is one that we haven't met before. What you see is a black gill. That's just a symptom of the presence of the parasite. What it really is, is the immune system responds to it, and it does so by identifying it 
and then surrounding it with a gas impermeable substrate that it makes. And that substrate is melanin, the dark pigment. That's why we see the black gill. The gill is actually part of the outside, the skeleton of the shrimp. And so when the shrimp sheds, it actually gets rid of its gill and underneath there's a pair of new functional gills. So we can't do that with our lungs. Um, but they can do that. So usually they survive it, or they can survive it, uh, unless it gets really, really bad and they, and they die in the process. The shrimp aren't going to go away. Even with this parasite, all of those are part of our natural ecology. It's always been here, it always will be. But the shrimp have grown up with it, and they'll survive. They have an incredible reproductive capacity. Every year we, we can have decimated populations, but the next year, we see huge populations in the spring population, and they manage to reproduce at that level, even in the presence of this problem. There's absolutely no problem for us to eat shrimp that had black gill. It has no consequences for human health. It doesn't taste different. And in fact, I think Georgia shrimp, and many will agree with me, are some of the best in the world. It makes me a little sad, to tell you the truth. When I moved here in the early 90s. I noticed shrimp boats everywhere, and that was it's clearly part of the cultural fabric of the Low Country. It would be a disaster, I think, if we lost that. You know, it's, it's one thing to go out and fish, but you have to have places to unload your fish. You have to have places to fix your boats. Uh, what once was, uh, you know, an infrastructure to support that on a large scale, uh, as we've seen changes in development, we've seen a loss of that, some of those traditional waterfronts. So, for example, what might uh, once used to be a picking house for, uh, for blue crabs might be a condominium now. You know, you have a, a boat dock similar to this that a bunch of shrimp boats tie up to and some developer comes in and says, well, the permit's already here for the dock. I can buy this land and put condos in. So the person who owns the dealer, who's the dealer says, I can take the money and retire. And all of a sudden you have 10, 12, 15 boats that have nowhere to tie up anymore. They lose their infrastructure. Uh, years ago, Red Simmons and his family owned the ice house, and that's where all the commercial vessels used to get all of their ice. They would unload their swordfish and their other fish um, that would come off, and it was a very viable, vibrant um, working dock. As the years went by, the number of vessels decreased. Um, Mr. Simmons passed away, and that, that property is now a restaurant. They've maintained the structure of the old ice house. You can still see the floor and the, and the structure, but you can also get beer and chicken wings there now. And what we're seeing in a lot of cases, we're seeing a shift in the demographics in our state where Darien, uh, Darien is in McIntosh County and it used to be for years and years the largest industry was commercial fishing. Now it's real estate. With a challenge, however, comes an opportunity. When a traditional method doesn't work anymore, a new model must take its place. In Charleston, lines of thinking converged when a multi-generational fishing family and a forward-thinking staff member at South Carolina Aquarium collaborated on a viable, sustainable way forward. Doing this for 32 years now, we all went fishing and we'd come back in and we'd sell directly to a dealer. He would go and front you your ice, bait, fuel, groceries, and you would go and harvest the fish, come back in, and he would deduct all those charges from your catch, and you would get what he felt fit to go and pay you, and you uh, went about your business. And we did well because we were able to catch a lot more species, a lot more fish. There were no regulations, um, what we had back then. And as time has gone on, we've had um, size limits in place, trip limits, closed seasons, marine protected areas. I think without regulations, without comprehensive and regional and even national regulations, in most places people would quickly wipe out whatever is most abundant or most desirable. Primary production is going to occur and some type of species are going to be there. The question is whether or not it's the species that we want. Is it going to be lionfish versus tuna? Is it going to be the groupers that we want or is it going to be some other species that's going to come in there and take that place that's going to consume whatever the ocean is producing. And without the regulations, we may end up with whatever ends up in the ecosystem. I was able to sort of read between the lines as seeing certain management come into play um, is when I went and made my move.
I stopped being a fishery biologist and we started selling directly to the high-end restaurants in Charleston, South Carolina. And then eventually that morphed into um, one of the first community supported fishery programs in the United States. My bills, my uh, mortgage payments, my car payments, all those didn't go away as fishery management came into play. So I had to go and sort of do something as our level of harvest went down, we had to keep our level of income up. So our mission was to minimize the amount of missions it takes to get our product to the plate. So on Mark's offshore, he will call me and he'll let me know he's got on board from the satellite phone and I turn around and I call the chefs and start selling product. We have three separate businesses and we're two people running them. It's a lot, um, but it does allow us to continue to, you know, to, to thrive, not just to survive, we're able to thrive. So I think direct to consumer is going to become bigger and bigger. People are caring a lot more about where their product comes from now. I think that there's going to be a lot more of people wanting to know where their product came from. And I think fishermen, if they can adapt and embrace that, can actually really, really do well. You all have um, some like small, small fishermen that actually come directly up to your spaces, right? Oh, without question. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that that's also some of the ways that things were always done before, right? The guy that actually catches it, you know, he also does all the marketing, all of, you know. And so I think that that's one of the pieces that we've, we're starting to get back to, especially with the sustainability. People are actually having conversation with each other. So it's not like, oh, I want this, fly it in from wherever. It's kind of like, no, what we have here is amazing. What we have here is truly amazing. Chef farmer Matthew Rayford practices what he preaches by serving only locally sourced, sustainable seafood since becoming a chef early on in his career. In fact, his family has been eating seafood this way all of his life. He learned this practice from his parents, who in turn learned from theirs, and so on through the many generations his family has lived in coastal Georgia. This is how they did it. Out of necessity at first, and now by choice. What Chef Rayford and the Marhefkas hit upon is applicable and adaptable by any chef, by any consumer, anywhere on this good planet, and especially right here in coastal Georgia. I always talk to people about the sourcing portion and how on one end it's not difficult, depending on where you want to go, but on the other end, when you're trying to stay novel, when you're trying to stay cutting edge, and when you're trying to stay on top of things, kind of makes sustainability is kind of a hard sell sometimes. And for us here, if I can't get it within 50 to 150 miles of here, then I start thinking about, okay, where am I located? So I'm located on the Georgia coast and I'm 29 miles from the Florida state line. I can actually get to Orlando faster than I can get to Atlanta from where I'm sitting. So I think that kind of philosophy of like how to be sustainable and how to bring the sourcing in is what I do. And then I require any of the food purveyors that I've worked with, and I've worked in, you know, locally with Cisco and Cheney Brothers and some other things. I always consistently ask for the locals list. So these are lion caught sea trout, um, some of the best. Every time I put this on my menu, we sell out. Every single time, as soon as we put it on. Here in Brunswick, Georgia, caught right off of the coastline right here. The Saplo clams that we're getting ready to get right now come from Saplo Sea Farms right here. I have my origin, which I know. I know where the island is. I know when the date was. And as a matter of fact, these came out of the water less than two days ago. And what's really interesting is a lot of those organizations are starting to realize that there are a lot of things that are right there that would be less expensive than if they bought it from, you know, the other side of the country. I write a column for the Savannah newspaper every week, and much like chefs like to do things that they like, they have to do things that people are going to eat. I need to write about things that people are going to be interested in. If I wrote the entire A section of the newspaper about sustainability, the average person is going to glaze over. It's not going to matter. I would put sustainability right now as a second or third cousin to the whole grass-fed beef movement, 
where some people understand what it is and some people might skew that way. But sustainable seafood is not even something that's close to mainstream for a consumer to understand and say, you know what, his seafood is sustainable, his is not. I get what he's doing, I'd rather go there. The average person doesn't get that. Okay. Okay. Um, the one pound would be um, nine dollars. The ability to get seafood that you know is going to sustain futures or future people available to have, to have seafood. And the second thing was the freshness of it. It's just absolutely incredible to have fish that has absolutely no smell. I think I would rather support and buy our seafood, you know, and know where it comes from, know that it's sourced. Um, you know, from where they say it's sourced, um, know that it's fished ethically. I really view myself more, more as an educator than anything else because I need to educate my purveyors on what's going on and what's happening, what my trends are here. Um, they may throw me a trend that's, you know, six states away. It might not be happening right here in Brunswick. So I need to work on some of those things also. I need to also educate my guests when they come in here, you know, where this came from, what it tastes like, why it tastes like that. And we've been able to do that. And I think as much as I am an educator, I also have to be a good listener. I have to be able to listen to my farmer, listen to my fishmonger. I need to be able to listen to my guests. I need to be able to listen to all of the things that are happening around sustainability. I need to be paying attention to that and I need to be taking it in. Today we're at a place where really the chefs are driving the process. They get it. They understand its business value. They understand the environmental impact. We realize now that the next frontier is to, to go after the general public. Make sure everybody is informed about why it's important to protect species in the ocean. We're trying to let the public know what's at stake. We have a marketing slogan called Ask Before You Order, and we're encouraging them to, to challenge the wait staff when they go to restaurants and, and say, you know, where, where did this catfish come from? Or where is this tilapia from? And also at the places that they, they shop, to take a look at the labels and make sure that they're understanding where that seafood originated. Our multi-generational fishing families tell us there has been a shift. So do our scientists and our chefs. Change is happening. So can our coastal communities hang on to the charm and beauty of their celebrated way of life and still keep fresh local seafood on our plates? How we respond to our shifting baselines determines our way forward. We as consumers must demand sustainably and locally sourced food. At seafood markets and restaurants, we must ask where the seafood comes from and then order it only if it is local and sustainable. We are the game changers. We have the power to reverse shifting baselines.